Thank you, everyone. So uh, this talk is titled, Who Knew Dog Food Could Taste This Good? Uh, and it is a WebAssembly and production story. So let's go ahead and introduce ourselves real quick. Um, I'll let Brooks introduce himself first. Yeah, I'm Brooks Townsend, lead software engineer at Cosmonic, and also I'm a maintainer of the CNCF open source Wasm Cloud, which is the app runtime we'll talk a little bit about today. I'm a part of this fun Venn diagram of people that knows Elixir, WebAssembly, and Rust. There's a very, very small intersection in the middle there. Um, love doing demos, and, and yeah, Taylor? Yeah, so I am a director of engineering at Cosmonic. Um, I am a Rustation, do a lot of Rust coding, came from doing Gopher stuff before, uh, and I am the co-creator of Crustlet and Bindle. If you've been looking at anything in the WebAssembly space, you've probably at least heard of Crustlet. Um, that was something I was a maintainer of, uh, or creator of. And then I'm also a general, like, serial open source maintainer. I'm an Emeritus Helm maintainer. Uh, I was a core Helm maintainer for a long time. So I wrote a good chunk of the Helm 3 code when it first came out. So you can either throw tomatoes at me later or thank me later, whichever one is your uh, pick. And so that's a little bit about us. So what are we going to talk about today? First off, we're going to go over what WebAssembly is. Um, and just out of curiosity here, how many people have heard of WebAssembly? How many people have used it? OK, there we go. That's what I thought. So we're going to talk about it um, a little bit and like what uh, what WebAssembly is, why it's important, and then what is this whole Wasm Cloud and Cosmonic thingy. This is setting kind of the, the foundation for what we're going to show we did in production with all of this. And then we'll go over the architecture of our, our applications and how everything is working, the deep dive into individual things we thought would be most important to share the lessons on, and then um, lessons uh, learned from that. And then after that, we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing next. So. We have this saying, if any of you have talked to us before, you've probably heard us say this, WebAssembly is neither web nor assembly, which is kind of funny given its name. Um, the big thing is that it's an open W3C standard, and it first became popular for the web when it came out. And because, it's for, it, because it became popular in the web, it has th some things that the web desires, and that's namely that it's safe and secure, efficient and fast, it's a polyglot thing, you can write it in any language, and it's portable, you can run in all major browsers. Now, all of those things that are listed there are also very good benefits for the server side. This is something you want on a server. You want it to be safe and secure, and you want it to be very efficient and fast. Um, you also want this to be a thing where you could write it in any language, and you want it to be able to run on any operating system, not just Linux, not just a specific processor, but every single operating system. And this is a, a very important selling point for WebAssembly and everything that we build on with it. But uh, that's just, remember that WebAssembly is a compilation target. It is in a language. I mean, there's, we, can, we can nitpick, but essentially that is true. Like, it is, a, it is a compilation target. You don't learn to write WebAssembly. You compile to WebAssembly. Now, the thing with WebAssembly is there are still some gaps. The language support, especially for server side, is still limited, but it's quickly growing. We had a Cloud Native Wasm Day a few days ago, and we heard a bunch about languages that are, that are getting very close. To, to having it. We're talking things like .NET and Python and things like that. So those are coming, they're not here yet. Um, networking has come along a little bit, but it's still very rough around the edges. Um, and you'll see why what we've done to kind of get around that. And then you still have to compile your dependencies into the final binary. So if you have a bunch of dependencies in there from, that you've imported, they, they get compiled in. And we're working on that part too. It's called the component model. And at the very base level, WebAssembly is numbers in, numbers out. And so that kind of limits how effective it can be when, when getting big adoption, but also that's being um, improved. There's no concrete types yet. So we're going to talk a little bit next about like where does all this fit in in the, in the scale, like what we're doing in, in computing and kind of what, Web is, what Wasm Cloud does. Yeah, so when you look at the modern computing environment, oh, there we go, and kind of what we see in the cloud native landscape over time, we've further reduced the amount of responsibility on the developer, and compute targets are, are getting smaller and smaller. So going from PC to VMs to containers, the responsibility is getting smaller and smaller, and containers were abstracting away the kernel. So you're still compiling for Linux, you're still compiling for a specific architecture. I know that there's Windows containers, but I'm just gonna keep rolling without mentioning too much of that. Uh, where we see WebAssembly fitting in is another step in that graph. So the compile target is getting smaller and smaller. Usually WebAssembly modules clock in somewhere between 20 kilobytes, maybe up to two megabytes at their largest. They've got deny by default security. And so it's really a, a truly platform agnostic uh, compilation target that developers can compile to. 
But still, with this, even though we have deny by default security, people are still baking in their dependencies into the final binary. So they're still taking code that they don't write the, the non-functional requirements and compiling it all together, the same thing that we do now. And that, that works really well for some use cases, but gets into a lot of pain when it comes down to the maintenance of the application. Oftentimes, you are recompiling your app for reasons that is not because your actual code changed, but because you needed to update some dependency that's open source and resolved a vulnerability, all those things. So Wasm Cloud takes this a step further and abstracts the capabilities or the non-functional requirements away from the application. And to give you a little bit of a concrete example, say like a to-do app. The functional requirements of a to-do app or you want to create, read, update, delete to-dos. Like that's the code that you as a developer are wanting to write. Like you have an idea and you want to implement that. The non-functional requirements are, I'm going to need to spin up a web server and listen on some port, and I need to store this in some persistent data store, and I need to pick which one I need exactly to compile in. All of that is abstracted away, the non-functional requirements. So you just get down to writing your, your business logic or your idea. And so to explain Wasm Cloud, uh, this is important because it's the underpinnings of our platform for Cosmonic. I like to go through it in a couple of different layers, and I'll talk about some of the benefits we get from it. At the base level, we're using a WebAssembly engine to execute WebAssembly modules. And so we're taking advantage of all the benefits of portability and security and easy scale for, with WebAssembly uh, at the base level. Now the Wasm Cloud application runtime, like I said, I'm part of a weird Venn diagram, is written in Elixir OTP uh, and Rust. So we get the security and speed of Rust, but the orchestration of processes and like the supervision model from OTP, which is really good at running small, lightweight processes. The Elixir process is kind of inspired, or Erlang process is kind of inspired what like Go routines and green threads kind of are today, uh, way back in the day. So we take advantage of that scalability, not just many different WebAssembly modules, but running them across different Wasm Cloud hosts. Now I talked about capabilities or non-functional requirements. These are things that you get to pick at runtime. So you code your app in terms of an abstract contract, something like a key value store. And you can do all those things with the interface, the key value interface, and then at runtime you say, okay, I'd like to use Redis. Or, okay, I'm deploying to my organization's cloud environment and I'm gonna use AWS DynamoDB. Those are all kind of composable Lego blocks, plug and play, and, and we actually get a lot of benefit of that, which we'll talk about a little bit later. The actors, uh, it, it's not quite like an actor model, but it's the WebAssembly modules that is implementing your business logic. And these are stateless, reactive pieces of compute that you can kind of deploy anywhere, stitch together to create your application. And the last part that really makes this all feel kind of like magic and what really abstracts a lot of pain for me personally is the Lattice Network. It's a interconnected, self-forming, self-healing network that's kind of powered by NATs under the hood. And basically, no matter where your WebAssembly modules are running, that only means so much for a distributed system if you can't actually have them talk to each other. So this deals with the connecting RPC no matter where the actual modules are running. And then Cosmonic, you know, so that's, that's Wasm Cloud in a couple of different layers. Cosmonic company that Taylor and I work for, we're building a platform for hosting WebAssembly applications. Our whole goal is to make it a painless experience to make distributed apps and to take that from dev to production. And the reason why we're talking about it today is because even though all of this power is in the open source, somebody has to manage this at some point. You see all of the benefits, you know, Kubernetes is something that you can do all on your own, but managed services are very popular because taking that complexity away from the developer, again, just reduces pain, reduces the management you have to do. Now, the real thing that we're here to talk about, we're here to talk about dog fooding or champagne drinking, whatever your you know, acronym is for it, but everything on the back end is built with Wasm Cloud. So we built our back end on WebAssembly modules, hot swappable capabilities in an effort to take advantage of all the things that we are putting out as benefits and prove that WebAssembly can be used on the server side now to run a platform. And we are running our platform in, in prod now. So that was the basic stuff to just understand. So to keep all that in mind, this is important context to understand these points, which is the real meat of what we want to talk about. So let's talk about our architecture. Um, we're just going to show this to you, actually. Give me a sec to swap over to this mirrored mode so I can show you. Um, hello. There we go. Okay. So what we have here is the entire uh, 
back end for Cosmonic running in Cosmonic. Uh, yeah, that, this, this is it right here. You can see the whole thing. This is the Cosmonic platform running on the Cosmonic platform, and you can zoom in and see how everything is connected one to another. Now, these lines are a little bit crazy, yep, but you can see like we have all these applications. They're written in WebAssembly connecting to these capabilities that were mentioned, and this is live. I'm not, this is not some demo or can thing. This is me looking at our actual running stuff that is running Cosmonic right now on, um, on this canvas that we have that lays it all out. Now, I know that all of this looks maybe a little bit um, as soon as we get back to uh, here. This is, this is the actual architecture oh, diagram. Oh, yeah. That happened. There we go. Um, so I know that it, it looks a little bit crazy. I mean, it kind of looks like this a little bit. Or one could maybe say this. Uh, but actually, like, I know, I know that seems like a crazy diagram going on right there. But this is actually really, really cool underneath the hood. And we just wanted to show you that, like, that's the final thing. But let's talk the details. So dog fooding 101, we always, like Brooks mentioned, call this drinking our own champagne, but most people call it dog fooding. Um, so when we started this product, we decided that we wanted to be customer zero. Uh, now, we could have whipped this all up really quick with Go or Rust or Elixir, like all things that we use. We could have just whipped this all out and said, here you go. But we, we decided, no, we need to actually do this. Like we were making some really strong claims here with what we're able to do, and we needed to put those to the test so that we could tell people, no, like we're not just making this up, we've actually done it. And so this learning for us has served two purposes. First off, it has improved our open core. This is still Wasm Cloud underneath the hood. And so this, everything that we discovered goes back into Wasm Cloud and makes it better for anyone using it from an open source perspective. But it also has improved the customer experience for us because we were our own customer. We had to go through a lot of the pain points before our customers ever had to. And so that's why we, why we did this. Now, what tech do we actually use? Obviously, Wasm. Uh, but beyond that, we also use OpenTelemetry. We use NATs for the communication layer. Um, we have various data stores, namely Vault and Redis being the big ones. Uh, we use AWS as, as well as a bunch of other cloud things, and we're not limited to that. Um, and we also, for our infrastructure, we do Nomad with our own custom task driver. We talked about that HashiComp recently, and it actually just went live on YouTube, I found out and console. So that's kind of our top stack of like what we're doing. And, and now we're going to talk about the specific details of how we leverage WebAssembly in here. It's with our deep dive part of all this. Yeah, so let's start out with one of the immediate benefits that we saw as soon as we started thinking about customer workloads. Everything that we coded for the, the back end that was interacting with a key value store was interacting with a key, an abstract key value store. So we were slotting in Redis, we were working with data, and then we realized that we're gonna be storing some secrets, you know, not specific customer data, but we're gonna generate secrets for customers, we're gonna you know, have things that we don't wanna just be sitting in some plain text key value store. So instead of modifying our applications that um, interacted with a key value store, we simply went out, we wrote a vault implementation, a HashiCorp vault implementation, and then this little line that you saw on the canvas there that we were dragging to Redis, just drag the line to vault instead. So with Wasm Cloud, all of our actors that we needed to store secrets, we can have them interact with vault, and none of that code actually needed to change when we were going from developing on it to, to changing to vault. So immediately the abstraction of capabilities is something that we saw benefits in. Now, for a while, Wasm Cloud is a distributed application platform. Even if things are all running on one machine, they're built for a distributed use case so that if you scale it across different machines, everything interacts the same, which means we have multiple network hops, multiple different failure planes, and I actually gave a talk about this on Monday at, Open to, or at Observability Day about when something goes wrong in a distributed system and you get error timeout, then everybody panics, we all hop on a call, it takes four hours to figure out what's going on. And so we added tracing a little bit into the development of Cosmonic, and all of that, again, went into the open core. So for Wasm Cloud, even if you're not using our platform at all, you can just give it an exporter URL and you get all of your workloads traced automatically. So we love kind of contributing that back. This is an actual example of one of the things that we um, like one of the traces that we can look at, it's an infrastructure provision. So when you go on Cosmonic and you say, launch a Wasm Cloud host for me, this is the trace of that happening. And you can even see what the sixth one down there from the bottom is actually collapsed. So, and each color change is a network hop, a change in service. And so we get a lot of mileage out of doing this tracing uh, for our own debugging. And, and because of that, our mean time to resolution has dropped a lot. 
And uh, last thing that I'll talk about before handing over to Taylor is we started with the benefit or the, the claim with WebAssembly that it's near native speed and can rapidly scale. And yup, it's fast. Nowhere in our performance testing, you know, when we're looking at something and like, why is this taking a second? It was never the speed of WebAssembly that was bottlenecking our system. It executes in max a couple of milliseconds, a couple of microseconds, and Nowhere in the platform, you know, we're running the entire platform. I don't know if you saw it um, when Taylor pulled it up, but each service, we have it kind of distributed for high availability, but we're running three instances of these like 250 kilobyte modules. So each piece of our platform is like, what, 750 kilobytes? That's how math works. It's very and, tiny. Yeah, very easy to scale, but we haven't even needed it with the, with the speed, which was awesome to kind of experience. So now from, uh, this goes more into the programming side of things, but we're, I want to talk a little bit about event sourcing and reactive programming. So these are going to be high level definitions. Nobody who's an expert in these fields get triggered with any of these definitions, please, because they're, they're going to be high level for those who may not be familiar with the concept. So reactive programming is basically where a piece of code is given some sort of data as a trigger, and then that code uses that trigger to inside of its logic to process that, that data. Um, this is the programming model that a lot of people have seen in serverless, um, right? Like you do an HTTP request or something and then it triggers your function to run and then your function does something. That's, that's an example of reactive programming. And Wasm Cloud is letting you do like plug, this pluggable thing of putting in different pieces along reactive programming. So data is processed and sent using these actors we've mentioned. And then when I'm talking about this, this is, this is stuff like config data and policy information. All of these different things can be sent um, and used as, as triggers in our system. Um, so we use, like, we use a messaging bus for this. In our case, it's NATS. And the Wasm Cloud actors are reactive to that data that comes in. So they receive the data they need from the message, do something with it, and then move on. So we use most of this in our customer-facing APIs, our configuration, and as the entry point into our event sourcing system. And I want to say, like, that's the first bullet point here. Wasm is very, very good at this. I mean, extremely good at it. Um, and Wasm Cloud makes the whole thing easier for us because, like I mentioned, NATS is the, the thing we're using, but it doesn't matter. If you wanted to use Kafka or RabbitMQ or any type of messaging system, you can just implement the contract and plug it in. And so then the actual business logic of handling your thing does not change. It does not have to know what it's connecting to or any of that stuff that you normally have to do in a reactive system. So then we also do, do all this with event sourcing. So event sourcing could be its own talk. That's why I'm going to, once again, give it a, a description of this that may trigger anyone who's an expert. Don't worry about it. Uh, this is, so this is the real softball definition. Um, but basically, we created a contract for this event sourcing. And event sourcing is this architecture pattern that treats every single bit of state as a log and divides the responsibility for what each of the, how each thing handles it across different logical components called aggregates, process managers, and projectors. Um, you don't have to know all the details of it. I'm going to show some diagrams for it. But once again, we did this with a contract. So this contract, we're going to open source. So that means what we're just tidying up some of it. We're putting a little bow on it before we do it. But we're going to be releasing this, this, this contract. And now, basically, you can get an event sourcing platform for free by just running it in Cosmonic or running it in Wasm Cloud with this, con with this contract. And if you want to run it differently and you want to have custom processing, you just re-implement the interface. So it's really, really flexible. And the value um, that we demonstrated before with sh shifting from Redis to Vault is, is that same kind of idea. We, liked, we first tested a super basic implementation of it, and then we built the real thing that does it like multi-threaded, locking all the different stuff you need. And the code that we wrote didn't have to change at all. We just swapped it out and boom, production ready. So what this looks like in practice, and this is the crazy diagram here for it again. Sorry, but I, I like putting these, these crazy diagrams up here. But this is like what uh, an event sourcing works for a wormhole. A wormhole for us is an ingress into our system. Space theme. Space Fun. theme, yep, that's, I mean, you got it. Um, and so we have different uh, commands that come in. They go to these different pieces. So each of these diamonds is a piece of code. And they all have to handle tons of different types of events. And some of these events go eventually get stored into Redis. And some get, some get triggered out into our infrastructure. But what the, so all of this crazy stuff that's happening is handled by these three things. So this is just screenshots from that, that thing I was showing you at the very beginning with like this, we have the, this aggregate and it's just pointing to this thing that's receiving its events, the um, basically an event sourcing provider. 
And then we have this process manager that does a lot of the logic handling, and it's just connected as well to that. Then we have something that's connected to Redis, and goes at like this is it's reduced to a very simple diagram. It looks like you sketched it and then put it into the cloud, and that's what we were going for with this. And event sourcing is has been a powerful model for us. But the whole point is just that it is a nice. Uh, the, these abstractions have worked really well for us because you can plug and play any of these things we've done we've done and adapt it for whatever you're doing inside of your your infrastructure and your systems. So the other thing we did is we. We learned here we abstracted over infrastructure. So provisioning Wasm Cloud on different infrastructure, on uh, different in, uh, on different infrastructure is like very. Uh, it's not agnost platform agnostic for obvious reasons. So uh, the Wa Wasm Cloud is very good at scheduling these applications, but we needed functionality to schedule the actual Wasm Cloud processes. Um, abstracting the infrastructure is is still really difficult. That's something we can't do very well. We kept it to a minimum and probably still did too much. And we needed the functionality of a scheduler, and so we came up with the our custom thing for Nomad that runs all these all these things. We use Nomad as the scheduler, and so if we could do it all again from the beginning, we would say that this is something where you, you can't really abstract over that with, with WebAssembly or even some of the providers. So we would just probably get the Nomad scheduler from the get-go rather than doing it. So that's one part where we thought it could work out well, and it and it didn't. And then last is this defense in depth. This has been a popular topic as of late. Um, let's talk about So we run untrusted code. That's the thing. This is all, all these, these things you write for your business logic, they're entirely untrusted. And so because of this, we need multiple tiers of defense. So Wasm itself gives us, gives us massive benefits here because it's a sandbox, and you can't do anything with it unless you explicitly give it permission to. It has the same permission model that you see on like a phone nowadays, where it says, can I use the microphone? Can I use the camera? Can I use this? And so you still have to do that with WebAssembly. And then um, we have, besides Wasm itself, we have the host security built into Wasm Cloud. So each actor and provider is signed, and they have to have those specific keys must be present in the cluster to know that it is signed properly. And it's completely decentralized checking. We don't need like a central server but they have to have explicit access granted to capabilities. You can't just all of a sudden access a database if you're not signed to be used as a database. And then we have this idea of the NAT security. NAT security also has decentralized authentication um, that, use, that uses signed keys and JWTs to actually authenticate. Um, this has helped us to segment traffic and data, but it's also presented a lot of different challenges for us. We needed to figure out how to allow the right things across the different information boundaries because this is a multi-tenant system but it was very powerful once we had figured it out. And then because it is multi-tenant as well, we have to have a set of allow and deny rules. And this is where it became really cool because those limit checks that we, we enforce, depending like limits on the platform, are actually provided using an actor that's written in WebAssembly. Um, and then we have, at the very end, we have this firecracker thing. And the firecracker was one example where the limits of WebAssembly show through for us. We needed Firecracker, which if you're not familiar with, is a micro VM released by, by AWS, by Amazon, to, to basically provide isolation and, for, for shared processes. So provide, like, we can't do everything that a provider needs to do with WebAssembly yet. We will soon in the future, but right now we can't. And so these are untrusted binaries. And to make sure people can run them, we have to make sure they are entirely walled off. And that's what we use the Firecracker side for. So we're going to go ahead and talk just a little bit about the lessons learned. Um, First off, welcome to the bleeding edge, everybody. Uh, that's what this whole thing is. The bleeding edge is real, and I, I understand that some of you might have requirements that exclude you from doing some of this because bleeding edge is a no-go at some big companies. I get that. But you get a really large list of very nice benefits from it. Um, basically, on the whole, all the benefits were incredible for us and proved that this new technology can fit really nicely next to existing tools and tech stacks. Like I said, we're using Nomad. We're using things that there's there's pieces of our, our system that like we're not going to run. Like we use Vector for logging stuff. We're not going to go rewrite Vector and try to get it to compile the Wasm. It runs in a container on another node in, in Nomad. We're still using technologies alongside. This isn't like a, hey, kick everything out and rewrite everything to Wasm. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that doing this as WebAssembly gave us some huge benefits. And we built this whole platform on top of it. One of the other motivations for us submitting this talk in the first place is we get this, we had this constant refrain of, oh, well, WebAssembly looks cool, but like you can't really do anything with it. I mean, we just showed you we're doing something with it. The whole thing is running on top of WebAssembly. Um, all the, the user interactions, those are all WebAssembly things that are handling it. 
And so we just want to say like that should inspire some confidence that you can actually do something real right now. So let's talk a little bit more about maybe some of the pros and cons of WebAssembly itself to kind of cover this. Yeah, so as we're going through, we're actively proving out this technology on the server side, and we know that the speed and the size and the scalability is, is incredible. We, we had great gains and, and loved watching that actually come together. Being able to compose WebAssembly modules together to create applications is really important and something that's difficult uh, depending on what framework you're using. And the deny by, by default security gives us a lot of confidence in our own platform and gives us kind of a flexible permissions model when we're making our own platform itself. Like even if we're writing the code, the deny by default security gives us confidence that if we pull in some open source library into the piece of logic that we're doing, we know that it can't do anything unexpected. If, we, if it doesn't have the permission to look at files on disk, it has no ability. It'll ask the host, can I read this file? And Wasm Cloud denies that. Another awesome benefit is that when we're developing our platform, we don't have Docker files, we don't have charts, we don't have a service mesh, we don't manage CRDs and controllers. We're not running on Kubernetes, we're running with WebAssembly and Wasm Cloud and using a scheduler to actually get the benefits of deploying the pieces of our compute on different parts of our, our platform. But it wasn't all sunshine and, sunshine and roses. We've been looking at something that Taylor has called the component model. It's an advancement in WebAssembly, and that's constantly changing. So as we're developing prototypes and looking to adopt it, you know, our, our prototypes break because the protocol is changing. We are, like he said, at the bleeding edge and get, you know, we're, we're prepared to bleed. Now, some of the things don't really lend itself to WebAssembly computing very well. If you're looking to have a long-running process that is just sitting in a WebAssembly module to sit there and run, WebAssembly is still single-threaded. So it doesn't really work very well to sit there and be constantly working on compute. The reactive programming and fitting to that paradigm is something that we worked with and, and worked really well, but it's still something to keep out for and or keep an eye out for. And the standards are interesting because they're, they're backed by the W3C, so it, any standard that comes through on WebAssembly needs to be acceptable for the web, and anything that we're implementing for WebAssembly needs to be acceptable for, for a standard moving forward. So classic researchers, they are taking a lot of things into account, trying to come up with use cases and standards that will work for everyone. And this is actually, you know, this is a good and a bad thing. We don't want to rush this. WebAssembly is a new technology. We can prove these things out and then publish the standard. We don't have to rush through, but still things like network sockets have kind of come along over years and years, and, and you know, we're building things kind of around that. And I want to point out here that the breaking changes that we're talking about are one of the benefits of using Wasm Cloud is that we try to paper over those and bridge the gaps for you right now. So that's why like you can there's HTTP servers and HTTP clients and we're we're bridging over that gap right now. And there's a lot of these things that we kind of make easier for you by doing it inside of Wasm Cloud to to make this something like I said, you can do something real right now. Yeah, so when it comes to Wasm Cloud specific le lessons, developing our app during contracts may have taken like a little bit longer in the beginning, but the management of these pieces uh, has been so much easier as we've developed our platform. Like a little earlier this week, we updated our Redis implementation, and instead of recompiling all of our little services that use Redis, we just updated the Redis service. Everything relinks, everything works just as before, which is a really attractive story for the management of an application because we didn't write like a Redis library. Like we got all of that from open source and taking the advantage of that, we don't have to recompile our whole platform to ship that. We really enjoy the reactive programming model and we, one, one detail that we may have not dove into uh, specifically is these implementations, the providers, are native Rust or native Go binaries. And that's because the ability to write those things in WebAssembly isn't quite there yet. Like there are network sockets now, but they weren't when we started writing the platform. Uh, Multi-threaded is coming along, so even writing like an HTTP server, if you use the new sockets, you need to run multiple of them to get that kind of multi-threaded environment. But the first time that I took our HTTP server and deployed it to like Ubuntu 22 or whatever that has OpenSSL 3 and it goes, eh, this was built with OpenSSL 1.1.1, just makes me flip the computer over, right? I'm sure that other people have seen that before. But we really want our whole platform to be this platform agnostic technology. It just makes it easier when I'm working on an M1 Mac and then deploying to x86 Linux, that binary not changing is huge. And we want to do that for everything in our platform. 
Yeah, and, and last, I think Taylor nailed multi-tenancy pretty well. We, we've got defense in depth, we've got firecracker VMs, we've got Cilium monitoring the networking, but when people are deploying their own pieces of code to this platform, we wanna have confidence that they're not escaping the sandbox doing anything nasty. So that leaves us with this question of, well, what, what happens next? Where are we going from here? Um, first off, there's some Wasm Cloud specific, or Cosmonic uh, specific lessons that we, we learned here, and that's this is for us, like what we want to do moving forward. We're going to keep being our own customer zero. Anything you tried on our platform, we'll have tried out first. Um, I mean, and this is completely true. So we've we've released some new features recently. Even some of our stuff that we use for like like ran, like task automation, we're actually running through our platform using wormholes, using all the things I mentioned. Um, each new feature that we add means more WebAssembly that we'll, we're going to be writing, and we're gonna share our future learnings with the community. Um, we also plan on driving work forward in the WASM standards, especially the, stu the stuff that allows us to compile providers to WebAssembly. Um, we, we want, like Brooks was saying, WebAssembly to work everywhere for everything, so that we don't have to, to keep papering it over with some of the stuff we're doing. For WebAssembly itself, um, the things that we're going to be contributing to are the component model. Um, I'm not gonna go into that here. I can talk your ear off about it. You can come by the Cosmonic or Wasm Cloud booth. I'll be there pretty much the whole time and you can chat to me, chat with me about that or, or Bailey who's also sitting up here in the front. And we'll, we'll, go over, um, we'll go over that with you. But it's a really cool thing that's coming out of the WebAssembly specifications. We're also gonna be working on SIG registry and Bindle. This is a part of the Bytecode Alliance that's um, working on how do we store complex applications that are, are WebAssembly modules. And then we're also trying to make, make networking a whole lot easier to use. So um, what can you do? So we have the Cosmonic platform. If you wanna check it out, there's the links. That's what the QR code links to. Um, our, our platform is, a, is open in a developer preview right now, so you can come check all this out, build your own crazy diagram like I did. Um, there's the link to the actual Wasm Cloud project, and then a couple other things. If you're doing things in Kubernetes, uh, which is very likely, we have something that we wrote called the Kubernetes Applier. We also have a chart for Wasm Cloud, and you can connect your stuff running in Kubernetes to stuff running in Wasm Cloud. So it, it's pretty straightforward and easy, and it's also, once again, written as an actor. And then we have the capability providers and interfaces we've been mentioning the whole time. So um, with that, let's leave a little bit of time for questions. We'll have a mic running around. Yeah, we have two minutes. So are there any questions? Yes, one here. So, so how does something like Crustlet fit into a WASM cloud world? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I can answer this one very clearly, having done, <laughs> done this. So at the, in the beginning with how like WASM cloud started, it was embeddable. Um, and so we actually put it into Crustlet to begin with. But Crustlet ha has become kind of more of a, we've, we proved what it was supposed to do and people have moved in different directions. A lot of us are working on these new things like WASM cloud. Some things have been like the container DSHIM stuff that Microsoft has been doing. Um, but Crestlet doesn't fit into this directly anymore. There's, there's easier ways that we think we can integrate with existing systems like the Kubernetes applier I was mentioning. So that's, that's where it stands with kind of the Kubernetes integration part. We have one over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah um, I guess first, like, really appreciate all the work you guys are doing. This is really cool. I'm enjoying learning about this project. I'm kind of curious. It sounds like there's a lot of effort being put into, like, the sandboxing and making sure that there's security in deploying a multi-tenant app, or I guess onto a multi-tenant platform. Um, is there anything in terms of like a capability for tenants to be able to host the, I guess, walls and binaries of each other's uh, execution or logic? That way, instead of something like a webhook model where you're like subscribing to uh, events, you actually are able to just host or I guess produce messages directly to uh, another tenant's um, I guess, binaries. So you're talking about like, you know, you, you have a WebAssembly module that's kind of executing and, and sending messages to like uh, other people who are also running on the platform. Yeah, this is something that we've talked about kind of from our roadmap from the beginning. From the, like we're running this thing on our platform. Everything needs to be denied by default. Like none of that, like communicating between, we call it a constellation. It's a segmented network space. That kind of communication needs to be opt-in. But we see really big benefits possible in like, say you're in an organization and you have a platform team. Platform team manages things like the connections to the databases, the message queues. They can deal with the maintenance and upgrades instead of every application developer using it, and then each application team would kind of hook in to the platform network space constellation so that the developers just deploy their logic, and then they can interface with the actual implementations, the thing the platform team kind of puts on. 
So we see a lot of benefits coming from that because like we talk about separation of non-functional requirements into capabilities. That's like exactly, I, I think Log4j is a good example of this. I know that this is probably overused at this point, but everyone's heard of it, so it's kind of an easy analogy. That one library is kind of copied across thousands of different applications. The idea with Wasm Cloud and, and Cosmonic is that the distributed logging capability provider would be managed by the platform team, used by every application team, but when vulnerability comes out, Platform team updates that once. Everyone kind of gets that for free. Does that, does that answer your question? Sorry. Nice. And we are out of time. Let's uh, give Brooks and Taylor one last round of applause. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>